This is Stephen Todman, pediatric cardiologist at LSU in Shreveport, and today we'll be going over acyanotic heart disease as part of the pediatric board review series. This will be an interactive case-based format, and we'll be going over the ABP content specifications. With regard to acyanotic heart disease, you'll have to be aware of VSDs, bicuspidic valves, um, different clinical findings associated with acyanotic congenital heart disease. You'll have to know how to uh, manage PDAs in premature infants, deal with hypertension, uh, how to deal with patients with severe pulmonary stenosis, and how to understand the uh, risks of patients with untreated left-to-right shunts and resulting pulmonary hypertension. There are some content outline portions that overlap with critical care, and we'll go over some of those. So with regard to congestive heart failure, we'll need to know the causes of ch uh, in children in various ages. Uh, we'll, it will be important to recognize the clinical findings associated with congestive heart failure, plan uh, initial diagnostic evaluation, and plan the management uh, in children of different ages. So an important thing to know right off the bat is that large left-to-right shunt lesions like PDAs, VSDs, and endocardial cushion defects typically present in congestive heart failure in about one to two months of age. And that happens when the pulmonary vascular resistance drops to normal levels, which is at that one to two month point. It's also important to know that ASDs do not fit into this category. So whereas PDAs, VSDs, and endocardial cushion defects present in uh, congestive heart failure at one to two months, ASDs do not. They typically will, prevent, pr uh, will present in heart failure um, in the adult age group, like 20s, 30s, around that time. So as with most things in pediatrics, the history is critical. Infants are gonna present with poor feeding, tachypnea, uh, poor weight gain, they can have cold sweat on their forehead. The tachypnea is gonna be worse with feeds. For older children, you're gonna see shortness of breath, particularly with activity. They're gonna be, uh, they're gonna have easy fatigability, their eyelids are gonna be puffy, and they'll have swollen feet as well. Physical exam findings are key as well. You can see tachycardia, a gallop rhythm. Cardiomegaly is almost always present, and chest x-rays are key for that. The, uh, they're going to be much more reliable for identifying cardiomegaly than will your physical exam. Other physical exam features that you can see are growth failure. Uh, they can have cold, wet skin. They can have perspiration. All of those things are, are, can be found in physical exam. So left-sided heart failure is going to manifest in pulmonary venous congestion. And you can see tachypnea, dyspnea on exertion. You can see orthopnea. You can have wheezing and crackles. So all of those uh, things can be seen on physical exam. And with regard to wheezing and crackles, uh, just be aware that, I mean, obviously the most common reason, reason for wheezing and crackles is asthma. Uh, but uh, if you're in a situation where you're treating your patient with multiple bronchodilators and things are not getting any better, it's important to take a step back and question your initial diagnosis. Maybe it's not uh, asthma at all. Maybe it's something else, in this case, CHF. On more than one occasion, I've seen uh, CHF present this way. So the physical exam findings of systemic venous congestion, which is caused by right-sided heart failure, commonly results in hepatomegaly. Um, for infants, you can see puffy eyelids. Sometimes we'll uh, have uh, adult uh, medicine uh, residents rotate through and when I ask them to go in to see an infant with, uh, who are worried about congestive heart failure, they'll come back and they'll report that there's no ankle edema. So one important thing to know is that although things like uh, distended neck veins and ankle edema is commonly seen in adults, they're not typically seen in infants. And splenomegaly is not indicative of congestive heart failure uh, at all. A lot of times people will group together hepatosplenomegaly, but you, uh, it's important to realize that splenomegaly in and of itself um, usually indicates infection. It's not indicative of congestive heart failure. So a baby's in CHF. How are you going to uh, treat that patient? 
the first thing is uh, if they're not going to be able to take in uh, a high volume of feeds, then you want to give them the most bang for their buck. You want to increase their caloric density. Uh, you can go, you can do 22 calorie per ounce, 24. You can just fortify it so they're so uh, they're getting as much nutrients per ounce as possible. Additionally, you can think about dropping an NG tube to give them. Uh, nutrition that way. Now, salt restriction is indicated in older children. Um, you could tell them to avoid salty snacks, table salt, um, reduce their uh, salt intake to less than 0.5 grams per day, but salt restriction is not indicated in infants. CHF can be treated medically with diuretics, afterload reducers, uh, depending on how severe it is, you can use inotropes. And ultimately, uh, if medical treatment isn't improving the CHF, then you want to consider palliative or corrective cardiac surgery. Okay, let's start with our first case. We have a six-year-old asymptomatic short male recently moved to Shreveport from New York City. There's a two out of six systolic ejection murmur at the upper left sternal border. There's a normal first heart sound and immediately it's followed by a systolic click and the murmur radiates to the back. So I'll give you a moment to ponder the diagnosis. So the pathology is pulmonary stenosis, and pulmonary stenosis can be valvar, subvalvar, or supravalvar. Um, for the clinical manifestations, if they're mild to moderate, is uh, that the patient will be asymptomatic. The murmur is typically a systolic ejection murmur at the upper left sternal border, and it radiates to the back. There can be a early, an early uh, systolic click or an, uh, an early ejection click, uh, which is indicative of a valvar issue. Um, and there can be a thrill, which means that the murmur is at least a grade four. The EKG and chest x-ray are typically normal in mild to moderate pulmonary stenosis. So as pulmonary stenosis progresses, the, uh, the, the murmur duration is prolonged and it becomes later peaking. So you can see it mi with mild pulmonary stenosis, you see the ejection click and then the crescendo, decrescendo murmur. Um, uh, whereas if as the murmur Im uh, increases in intensity, the murmur becomes later peaking and uh, it even can even uh, go past uh, the second heart sound. So here we have a chest x-ray of typical pulmonary stenosis. I'll give you a moment to see if you can decipher it. And here you can see that the MPA segment is dilated. You can see that the pulmonary vascularity is normal. And the lateral view shows that the clear space in, uh, anteriorly is not clear, indicative of uh, increased uh, right ventricular dimension. Here we see a chest x-ray from a patient with pulmonary stenosis. We can see uh, increased RV forces in V1, just very tall R waves. We don't see uh, as much reciprocal changes in V6, but clearly this is uh, 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 indicative of, of RVH. So here we see uh, a short axis image uh, parasternal short axis image. We can see the aorta over here. We see the uh, left atrium, right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, pulmonary valve, and the MPA. And you can see a doming dysplastic pulmonary valve. And when we uh, add color, you can see aliasing at the level of the pulmonary valve all demonstrate the pulmonary stenosis. So this is a subcostal image of a patient with pulmonary stenosis. You can see antegrade flow uh, going through the stenosed valve from the right ventricle, and you can also see um, regurgent and flow in red uh, coming backwards into the right ventricle. The right ventricle itself appears to be hypertrophied. So here's a cartoon image uh, demonstrating the way that pulmonary stenosis is dealt with. We can see a catheter, which is about the size of a spaghetti noodle, passed up through the inferior vena cava into the right atrium, down through the tricuspid valve, and uh, into the pulmonary artery. The uh, wire is anchored into the left pulmonary artery, and the balloon is blown up uh, at the level of the stenosis.
So here's an angiogram uh, where the catheter is in the right ventricle. I'll let the loop pass, uh, play through. So the injection is in the right ventricle. You can see the dysplastic pulmonary valve into the PAs, and now you see the levophase where the ascending aorta uh, and left side of the heart is uh, demonstrated clearly. So here again, you can see the dysplastic pulmonary valve uh, with the pulmonary artery left and right uh, that come into view. It's classic with pulmonary stenosis. So lateral injection into the right ventricle, you can see the dysplastic pulmonary valve, and now we're gonna see a wire passing into the, the MPA. You can see the balloon inflate and the waist uh, is at the level of the stenosis, which uh, is eliminated when the balloon inflates, uh, relieving the stenotic area. Moderate to severe pulmonary stenosis, the EKG typically demonstrates right axis deviation in RVH. The chest x-ray is usually normal, but it can also show diminished vascular markings as well. The treatment for mild to moderate pulmonary stenosis is observation, and severe pulmonary stenosis, uh, you typically do balloon valvuloplasty. If it's ductal dependent in the first you know, week of life, you can do prostaglandins. Pulmonary stenosis, the natural history, uh, if it's mild, is that it's non-progressive. So if you had to pick a heart disease for yourself or a loved one, you would want a mild pulmonary stenosis because it's non-progressive and uh, the patients are asymptomatic and you have a cool heart murmur. Uh, for much severe pulmonary stenosis, the, uh, the, it typically progresses. And the associations that you need to know uh, for your exams are Noonan syndrome. So Noonan syndrome, or specifically PTPN11, has an association with pulmonary stenosis. In general heart disease is uh, pre present in about 50% of patients with Noonan syndrome. Most commonly it's pulmonary stenosis, but it can also be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Here we see a patient with some typical features of Noonan syndrome. We see the uh, wide space nipples, shield-shaped uh, shield chest. We see a webbed neck and a low posterior hairline. There's also scoliosis. So this is a nice slide of pulmonary stenosis. You can see up to 83% of patients have short stature. Um, you can see the characteristic uh, facial features. Um, we can see the congenital heart disease that, we, uh, that are typically present, like pulmonary stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, as well as other clinical manifestations that you can see in patients with Noonan's. So in patients with peripheral branch pulmonary artery stenosis, um, you need to know the typical uh, genetic associations, uh, Williams syndrome, Noonan syndrome, Allergyle syndrome, uh, Ehlers-Danlos, Ehlers uh, Russell Silver, or Silver Russell, as it can be called, or congenital rubella. Um, it's the classic auscultatory findings in peripheral branch pulmonary artery stenosis is the murmur in the pulmonary area, but it radiates prominently to either one axilla or both axillae. So let's jump into case number two. We see a seven-year-old female presenting with chest pressure with exercise and a heart murmur. The murmur is three out of six systolic. It's crescendo decrescendo, and it's an ejection type murmur at the base, which radiates to the neck. We have an early systolic click present, and that click is loudest at the left lower sternal border or apex, and there's a thrill in the suprasternal notch as well. So I'll give you a moment to ponder the diagnosis. So this is aortic stenosis. The pathology can be valvar, subvalvar, or supravalvar. If it's valvar, you'll typically have a click, which is an early systolic click, uh, like in our patient, which is typically at the apex or can also be at the left lower sternal border. Uh, you can see, now the murmur itself uh, is uh, a lot of times at the upper right sternal border, but it could also be at the upper left sternal border um, and radiating to the neck. The click, as I said before, can be present, and there can be a thrill um, if the murmur is a, at least a grade four. The murmur of aortic stenosis is generally loudest at the upper right sternal border, and it will radiate to the carotid arteries bilaterally.
In children, uh, the murmur can be at the upper left sternal border, and the murmur itself uh, increases in severity, as it increases in severity, can be louder, harsher, and later peaking. Now, if the patient also has concomitant aortic regurgitation, there can be a diastolic decrescendo murmur as well. So the important takeaway from this slide is that you can have a palpable thrill in the suprasternal notch in up to 85% of patients with valvar aortic stenosis. So conceivably, you can just put your finger in the suprasternal notch, and if you feel a thrill, you can have a uh, good index of suspicion that you're dealing with aortic stenosis. I, typically, though, I, I recommend that you use your stethoscope. So moderate to severe aortic stenosis, uh, with that you can see uh, chest pain, syncope, or even sudden death. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, cardiology will be referred a patient with chest pain, and very rarely it's the heart, uh, or you know, it'll, you'll have a patient with a patent foramen ovale, and the referring doctor will wor you know, will be concerned that this chest pain in this patient with a patent foramen ovale um, could have a um, cardiac pathology that's causing the, the chest pain, um, but it, it really isn't the case. However, um, if you have a patient with aortic stenosis and they tell you that they have chest pain or syncope, then you need to take that really seriously because that could be the, the way that uh, uh, aortic stenosis presents uh, with ischemia or things like that. Now, the neonatal presentation of severe aortic stenosis can be heart failure. The EKG in mild aortic stenosis is typically normal, and for moderate to severe, you can have LVH plus or minus strain. And all uh, strain is is if you take the um, axis of the QRS and the axis of the T wave, it's a greater than 90 degree difference. And if that's the case, then you have strain. Now, the chest x-ray is typically normal in uh, mild aortic stenosis, and the natural history is that it's progressive. So unlike you know your mild um, pulmonary stenosis, uh, Aortic stenosis is typically progressive, and that has implications for your follow-up. So here's a patient with aortic stenosis. You can see a uh, deep S waves in V1 and tall R waves in V6 um, from the uh, LVH. And that is present in aortic stenosis. Here we have evidence of a subaortic obstruction. This is an angiogram with an injection into the left ventricle. So aortic stenosis, the treatment uh, for mild to moderate is observation. For severe in the neonatal period, you're going to uh, offer prostaglandins and balloon valvuloplasty. For severe in the child or adolescent period, you can do balloon valvuloplasty. And the associations that you have to know are bicuspidic valve, coarctation, and Williams syndrome. Now, Williams syndrome can also have sub, uh, supravalvar aortic stenosis as well as pulmonary stenosis, but these links and associations are critical. Here we have an example, a pathological specimen of a normal tri-leaflet aortic valve at the top and a calcified bicuspid aortic valve at the bottom. Parasternal short axis view, we can see the bicuspid aortic valve in the center. Parasternal long axis view, um, we see the aliasing at the level of the aortic valve from the same patient with aortic stenosis. So here's the typical face, facial features of a patient with Williams syndrome. You can see stellate irises, a short nose with a bulbous nasal tip, flat nasal bridge, prominent full cheeks, a long philtrum, wide, a wide mouth, mild macronathia, and triangular facies. And again, the cardiac manifestations to be aware of are, are supravalvar aortic stenosis, supravalvar pulmonary stenosis, peripheral branch pulmonary artery stenosis, and renal artery stenosis um, with systemic hypertension. So these patients are incredibly friendly, uh, they have delayed speech acquisition, and then you just can't stop them from talking. They're super friendly with this cocktail party personal, uh, persona. They have hyperacusis, they have variable mental retardation. Um, if that's not enough, they have ADHD and anxiety. And elect from an electrolyte perspective, uh, it's important to know that they can have hypercalcemia. So case number three is our 15-year-old female asymptomatic with a widely split fixed.
text S2, a short two out of six systolic ejection murmur at the upper left sternal border and a diastolic murmur at the left mid sternal border. I'll give you a moment to think of the diagnosis. So this is an atrial septal defect. Uh, females outnumber males. The most common type of ASD is the secundum, and uh, it's important to know that sinus venosus defects are associated about 90% of the time with partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. Here's an example of pathologic specimen on the right and the uh, and a kind of a cartoon on the left, you can see number one is where a secundum ASD would be, um, number two would be a, a primum ASD, uh, number three would be more of a, a sinus venosus, and uh, number four would be a coronary sinus ASD. Clinical manifestations of ASDs, uh, it's important to know that the pediatric patients are typically asymptomatic, so they're not in any CHF, and that's, you know, particularly concerning uh, because it's very easy to miss ASDs in younger children. The murmur itself is the, the famous wide-fixed split S2, but there can also be a, wide, um, a systolic ejection murmur at the upper left sternal border and a mid-diastolic rumble from relative tricuspid stenosis at the left lower sternal border. So the uh, systolic murmur is from relative pulmonary stenosis, not that there's anything wrong with the valve, but just a flow-related phenomenon, and the diastolic rumble is from the relative tricuspid stenosis, which is also a flow-related phenomenon. So this is a uh, chest x-ray of a patient with an ASD. You can see a prominent uh, right atrial appendage. You can see increased pulmonary vascular markings, as well as a prominent main pulmonary artery. The EKG in uh, ASDs can show this RSR prime in V1. Um, it's uh, Whenever you see this RSR prime pattern in V1, you should be on the lookout for ASDs, but to be honest, it's much more likely that the RSR prime pattern uh, will be found in normal uh, children, but uh, you should also be on the lookout that it can be indicative of an ASD in children as well. Here's a four-chamber view. We can see the dilated right atria and right ventricle, uh, and you can see the ASD in the uh, four-chamber view. But it, this, this uh, four-chamber view is not the best uh, view for an ASD in general because there's often a lot of dropout at the septum. So this is a subcostal view. You can see left to right shunting at the level of the uh, atria and with just a little bit of uh, reversal of flow that you can see in blue across the septum. Atrial septal defects, uh, the natural history is that uh, small defects, tend, typically less than five millimeters, tend to close spontaneously, uh, usually prior to four years of life. And larger defects, which are uh, about greater than eight millimeters, I would say, rarely close spontaneously. So, as th And that kind of goes into treatment. Interventional calf uh, closure is recommended um, around school age um, for most ASDs. And if there are no... Uh, if there are no uh, good anchor points for uh, device closure, then surgical closure uh, would be your next option. And the association to remember is Holt Orum. Many different devices can be used to close atrial septal defects. The Amplatzer device, the Gore Helix septal occluder, um, CardioSeal, BioStar, just uh, numer numerous uh, devices can be used. Here's a nice cartoon image of the ASD device. You can see the wire first going in from the right atrium to the left atrium and then the catheter following the wire. The wire is withdrawn and the first disc of the device is deployed. Then it's pulled snugly against the atrial septum. Note the anchoring points. And then the second disc is uh, deployed. So it sandwiches this uh, atrial septal defect and then the locking mechanism and the catheter is withdrawn. So Holt Orum uh, is a autosomal dominant syndrome, and you should know that the uh, gene TBX5 is linked to it. Uh, you can see preaxial radial ray abnormalities of the upper limbs. You can see severe focomelia, or you can just have uh, more mild hypoplasia of the involved bones. And cardiac conduction defects are often present.
These are more imaging studies of a patient with Holt Orum. Uh, you don't have to be a radiologist to see that you're missing something on the left, and uh, the uh, X-ray on the right uh, is just demonstrates your typical atrial septal defect, uh, prominent right heart, and increased lung vasculature. So case number four is a two-month-old male who feeds one ounce of Enfamil every two hours and feeds in about 50 minutes. There's a two out of six holosystolic murmur at the left lower sternal border, and there's hepatomegaly present as well. So I'll give you a moment to contemplate what this pathology could be. So it's a VSD, and VSDs are the most common type of uh, congenital heart defect. The pathology of small VSDs uh, are a holosystolic murmur at the left lower sternal border. There are many different types of, atrial, of uh, ventricular septal defects. Um, the nomenclature varies, so I wouldn't get too excited about the nomenclature uh, per se, but I would want to make note that there are certain uh, defects that are near the aortic valve that can predispose to aortic valve uh, prolapse and resulting regurgitation, which we'll talk a little bit more later. So here's a still uh, image, uh, four-chamber view, where you can see an apical muscular VSD at the bottom. And on the right of the screen, you can see a uh, mid-muscular VSD uh, denoted by the star. And on the left side of the screen, you can see a, a more of an uh, anterior muscular VSD. Four chamber view, you can see turbulence in the muscular septum and a parasternal short. You can see the turbulence at the paramembranous uh, region. And this uh, paramembranous VSD uh, does predispose to aortic valve prolapse. Parasternal long axis view, you can see the chambers noted as you can point out the VSD. You can see flow through the VSD in a high-velocity jet, denoting uh, no pulmonary hypertension. So VSDs, uh, in, uh, in general, they're, if they're small, their patients are typically asymptomatic with normal growth and development. The EKG is typically normal, and the chest x-ray is typically normal. For moderate to large defects, you have that same holosystolic murmur at the left lower sternal border, uh, but you can also have an apical diastolic murmur from increased flow velocity across the uh, mitral valve. Here's a chest x-ray in our patient with a VSD. You can see cardiomegaly and increased pulmonary vascularity. For moderate to large VSDs, you can see uh, poor weight gain, decreased exercise tolerance, frequent lower respiratory tract infections can be seen as well, and just overall CHF usually develops around one to two months of age with VSDs of this size. Uh, EKG can show LVH, or biventricular hypertrophy, left atrial enlargement, and the chest x-ray often will show cardiomegaly with increased pulmonary vascularity. The treatment for VSDs uh, is typically diuretics, and you want to repair them surgically at least by four to six months of age in order to prevent pulmonary vascular occlusive disease uh, and uh, eventual eisenmangers. Spontaneous closure of paramembranous and uh, muscular VSDs can occur, and it's, that's typically more frequently seen in, with small defects during the first six months of life. Uh, moderate muscular VSDs, about 60% of those will close spontaneously. Paramembranous VSDs close spontaneously about 35% of the time. And inlet defects, uh, as well as infundibular defects, uh, often will not close spontaneously. So this clinical pearl that I want to relate, uh, I've already, actually I've already uh, discussed it, Outlet type or paramembranous defects are at risk for the aortic valve prolapsing into the defect, which results in aortic valve insufficiency, and that's an indication for surgery. So if you have a patient with a, a holosystolic murmur, um, and you know the region, the, the, the VSD is uh, around the uh, aortic valve, if now this patient has a diastolic murmur, you may think that uh, this, this could be the uh, clinical manifestation of
a or aortic valve that's prolapsing into the defect and you want to have that child referred for consideration of cardiac intervention. Case number four, a one-year-old female who's asymptomatic and has a two out of six continuous murmur at the left upper sternal border and left infraclavicular region. So this patient has a patent ductus arteriosus. You can see a ductal bump on the chest x-ray and uh, angiogram, you can also see the uh, ductal bump. Chest x-ray demonstrates cardiomegaly. Uh, there is uh, double density and elevation of the left main stem bronchus, which is a really good finding. You can see it on the left, uh, the left sided uh, chest x-ray where the left bronchus is just kind of turned up um, from the left atrial enlargement. And you can also see uh, prominent uh, LV, MPA, and ascending aorta as well. And you can also see uh, pulmonary vascular congestion. Here we have a angiogram still of the PDA. You can see the MPA and then a conical uh, PDA that leads to the aorta. Here's a short axis view where we can see the RPA RPA, LPA, and PDA in red. So the murmur of a small PDA is continuous and typically at the left upper sternal border. The clinical manifestations uh, of the small PDA are that the patients are typically asymptomatic with normal growth and development. EKG is normal and chest x-ray is typically normal as well. For moderate to large PDAs, you, you'll also have that continuous murmur at the left upper sternal border, but you can also have an apical diastolic murmur in much the same way uh, as you would have an apical diastolic rumble from a VSD. You, for the same reason, you can have it with a PDA. And you can also have bounding peripheral pulses with wide pulse pressure. In the NICU, one thing that you can do is you can feel uh, the palms of the infants, and if you feel prominent uh, Palmer pulses, that would make you, your index of suspicion greater for a PDA. For moderate to large PDAs, you can have this uh, CHF type picture. You can have poor weight gain, decreased exercise tolerance, frequent lower respiratory infections. Uh, EKG is uh, typically will show LVH or even biventricular hypertrophy. And the chest x ray, uh, as we showed, shows uh, cardiomegaly with increased pulmonary vascularity. So non surgical. Uh, PDA closure is the uh, really the gold standard in most centers. Uh, you can do uh, treatment with indomethacin or ibuprofen, uh, which works particularly well in the immediate newborn period and works very well with preterm infants particularly. And uh, ultimately, though, as I said, uh, device closure in the cardiac catheterization laboratory is first line, although you can also do surgical ligation as well. So here's a lateral uh, angiogram injection into the MPA. You can see the conical PDA, and then this is after the PDA device closure, and you can see no flow through the device. It's important to keep venous hums in your differential for continuous murmurs. They don't really sound the same, but uh, you know, whereas PDAs are, are machinery-like, uh, more coarse, uh, venous hums are much more soft. Uh, the key way to, to uh, identify a venous hum is that they'll probably tell you that they hear the, mur the murmurs heard uh, turning your head in one direction, and when you turn your head in the other direction, it's less well heard. Um, you hear it when the child is sitting up, and when they're lying down, you don't hear it as well. So that's, that's your classic venous hum. Venous hums, uh, you're going to be reassuring the patient versus PDAs, which you'll be doing cardiology follow-up. So there's a, a difference that you need to know. Case number five, we have a one-month-old male with Down syndrome and a systolic heart murmur. So you need to ask, what's the most likely cardiac defect? The most common cardiac defect is an endocardial cushion defect. Uh, the complete AV canal is the most common form. Uh, you can have a primum uh, ASD, an inlet VSD, and as well as a cleft mitral valve. And as you can see, there is intraatrial and intraventricular communication as well as the possibility for AV valve regurgitation. Yeah. <laughs>
So there are many different types of uh, AV canals. The complete uh, was the one that we were looking at. Um, you can see in the complete AV canal, you have one annulus and you have two opportunities for shunting through the atria and through the ventricular level. Uh, there's also intermediate, transitional, and partial, and you can see the different um, varieties. AV canals can be picked up in utero. In fact, it's one of the more common uh, defects seen uh, in fetal ultrasound. So you, here you can see the AV canal picked up on a standard four-chamber view. You can see one common AV valve and uh, an opportunity for uh, flow through the ventricular septum and also the atrial septum as well. This is your classic complete AV canal. And this is another apical four-chamber view where you can see the complete AV canal. You can see a secundum ASD, inlet uh, VSD, and also a primum ASD as well. So patients will typically have signs of uh, congestive heart failure. There can be a systolic ejection murmur at the upper left sternal border from relative pulmonary stenosis, as well as an apical holosystolic murmur from mitral regurgitation. And additionally, you can have a gallop rhythm and hepatomegaly if there's CHF present. The EKG is a very helpful tool to identify endocardial cushion defects. Uh, typically, your QRS axis is in the, uh, the southwest uh, quadrant or the southeast quadrant, um, but in uh, AV canals, it will be in the northwest or even the northeast quadrant. In adults, you can have um, your uh, QRS axis up to negative 30 which is a little bit into your uh, northeast quadrant, um, but uh, it should never be further than that into the northeast quadrant or the northwest quadrant. The northwest qu quadrant is also d uh, called the indeterminate uh, quadrant, so you can hear, uh, you can see the exam questions written as indeterminate axis or, you know, northwest axis, all that's the same thing, um, and uh, it makes your index of suspicion for endocardial cushion defect much higher. You can also have a first-degree AV block, um, RVH, and chest x-ray will often demonstrate cardiomegaly with increased lung markings. So here's an EKG of a patient with a complete AV canal. You can see a, uh, that you're uh, down in lead one and you're down in AVF. So this is your classic northwest axis for uh, endocardial cushion defects. Endocardial cushion defects uh, will typically present in heart failure at one to two months after birth. Uh, you can have uh, recurrent lower respiratory tract infections. Treatment, uh, as for most patients with CHF is going to be Lasix and surgical repair at about four months of age to prevent uh, pulmonary vascular obstructive disease. And the association that you need to know is Down syndrome. Okay, on to some questions. So the first question, which of the following typically does not present with heart failure in the pediatric age group? Your choices are VSD, ASD, PDA, and endocardial cushion defect. I'll give you a moment to pause. So the correct answer is atrial septal defect. They typically present clinically in heart failure uh, in more of the adolescent adult period, usually in the 20, in uh, the second decade of life. Question number two, when do patients with large left to right shunts typically present in heart failure? So your choices are one week of age, two months of age, one year of age, or at birth. I'll give you a moment for that. And the answer is two months of age. Question number three, true or false, an early systolic click typically represents an abnormal semilunar valve. And the second question, true or false, a mid-systolic click typically represents mitral valve prolapse. So I'll give you a moment for that. 
So for both of these answer choices, the answer is true. Next question, true or false, the murmur of pulmonary stenosis typically peaks later and is louder with increasing severity. And the answer is true. Question number five, true or false, mild pulmonary stenosis is typically progressive. And the answer is false. Mild pulmonary stenosis is typically non-progressive, whereas aortic stenosis tends to be progressive. Question number six, true or false, Williams syndrome is associated with supravalvar aortic stenosis. So that is true. It can also be, uh, I could have written supravalvar pulmonary stenosis as well. Next question, Noonan syndrome is associated with pulmonary stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And that is true. Question number eight, true or false, a suprasternal notch thrill is frequently seen in patients with pulmonary stenosis. That is false. Suprasternal notch thrill is frequently seen in patients with aortic stenosis. Question number nine. Describe the physical exam findings in a 15-year-old patient with an atrial septal defect, particularly the auscultatory findings. So you're going to see uh, a wide fixed split S2, a 2 out of 6 systolic murmur at the left upper sternal border from relative pulmonary stenosis, and you can also see a diastolic rumble in the tricuspid region from relative tricuspid stenosis. Question number 10, true or false, holt orum is associated with VSDs and thumb abnormalities? So the answer for this is false. It's ASDs and thumb or radial abnormalities. Question number 11, true or false? A concern of some VSDs is the predisposition of the aortic valve to prolapse through the VSD, resulting in aortic insufficiency. And that's true. Question number 12, true or false, continuous murmurs in the infraclavicular area are always pathologic? And that is false because venous hums uh, can have a continuous murmur in that location and they are um, non-pathologic. Question number 13, true or false, complete AV canal is the most common cardiac defect seen in patients with Down syndrome. And the answer is true. The second most common are VSDs. Question number 14, true or false, a superior QRS axis is commonly seen with all VSDs. And that answer is false. Superior QRS axis is more commonly seen with endocardial cushion defects. This is a prep question from 2013. You are evaluating a two-month-old male infant who has a history of a moderate-sized VSD. The mother reports that he has been feeding poorly for the past few days. She reports that during feedings, the infant coughs and appears short of breath. On physical exam, the infant's respiratory rate is 65 breaths per minute and heart rate is 155 beats per minute. Blood pressure and oxygen saturations are normal. He has mild subcostal retractions and fine bilateral crackles. The procordium is active and there is a grade three out of six holosystolic murmur that's heard best at the left lower sternal border. The liver is palpable three centimeters below the right costal margin. Pulse rates and perfusion are adequate. Of the following, the medication most likely to provide significant clinical improvement is oral, and your choices are captopril, carvedilol, digoxin, furosemide, or spironolactone. And the correct answer is furosemide.
Next question, a three-month-old girl who has Down syndrome exhibits poor weight gain, tachypnea, and low-pitched uh, grade 2 murmur. There's a chest x-ray that shows cardiomegaly and increased pulmonary vascularity. EKG demonstrates RVH and a superior frontal plane QRS. Of the following, the most likely diagnosis is, and your choices are coarctation, complete AV canal, PDA, per perimembranous VSD, or secundum ASD. And the correct answer choice is B, complete AV canal, or you could also be called endocardial cushion defect, atrioventricular septal defect. It has many names, but that is the correct answer. Our last question, you are evaluating a newborn six hours after his birth. Labor and delivery were uncomplicated, but amniocentesis performed during the pregnancy revealed trisomy 21. The infant currently is sleeping and is well perfused with a heart rate of 140 beats per minute and no audible murmurs. His physical features are consistent with Down syndrome. Of the following, the most appropriate diagnostic study to perform is, and your choices are barium swallow, cervical spine radiography, echocardiography, head ultrasonography, or radiography of the abdomen. And the correct answer choice is echocardiography. Any patient with Down syndrome must have an echocardiogram uh, prior to being discharged from the hospital. Thank you very much, and best of luck on your exam.